I would like to welcome you. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, to our last lecture intervention uh, of the uh, project uh, Transpositional Geologies, a cooperation between uh, the artist Sasha Miklowajp and the, the Mineralogical Museum of the University of Bonn. And I have the pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Chris Hill. He works at the Faculty of Creative Industries at the University of South Wales. He is a modern British historian and uh, he has research interests in histories of activism, imperialism, media, and nuclear politics. Chris has recently completed an early career leadership fellowship uh, that was funded by the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council um, for a project entitled The New Nuclear, Nuclear Imperialism, Science, Power, and Diplomacy in the British Empire. As one of the major outputs of his project, uh, Chris will be publishing a monograph about the uh, political ecology of Namibian uranium, and this one will be entitled Radiant Empire, Africa's Last Colony and uh, the Making of Nuclear Britain. And um, as we see, this is also yeah. the title of his uh, lecture today. And Thank you. Please. Chopping and changing slightly <laughs> as I try to nuance exactly what I want this to be about and what I want it to say. Uh, herzlichen Dank uh, for the introduction und Einladung hier ans Mineralogische Museum zu kommen und guten Tag, liebe Gäste im Publikum. <laughs> that took a lot of effort, I'm sure you believe <laughs> that. So for the remainder of the talk, I plan to spare both your ears and your language by speaking in English. Um, it's a particular honor I think to be here uh, because the history of this organization is interwoven with the subject of my talk, which is the history of the Rossing uranium mine. And there is a particular link to a professor of geology who gained the professorship in 1927, which was Professor Hans Kluse professor of geology at the University of Bonn in 1927. And he's a fascinating figure because he was both complicit, I suppose, in the colonial structures, which this exhibition is seeking to expose and critique, but also you get from him a sense of the excitement and dynamism that existed around geology as a scientific discipline at this particular moment in history. Take, for example, and if you've never read his autobiography, it's translated into English, so I was able to appreciate how beautifully written it is for a layman like me. I'm not a geologist, I'm a historian. So I'm trying to understand something of the complex science of geology for the first time. And you can see from this quotation how excited he is. This is in 1947, but looking back on his career in geology, for the first time since its beginning, our planet Earth sees and understands itself. For a billion years, the Earth rolled on, quite blind and mute. It has used up all this enormous period of time in forming out of plants and animals through millions of unfinished experiments, the organ through which it will recognize itself. For a billion years, the patient Earth amassed documents and inscribed them with signs and pictures which lay unnoticed and unused. Today, at last, they are waking up because man has come to rouse them. Uh, stones have begun to speak because an ear is there to hear them. So there is this very pregnant sense of history, this expectation. And that enmeshes, I think, with the colonial encounter of what would have seemed to Professor Hans Kluse rather different surreal, exciting environments, new landscapes, uh, new geological formations to be understood, which might just provide the secret to the earth. There is another interesting link uh, to the University of Bonn, which uh, lies in the person of Heno Martin, who I'm sure some of you will be aware of. And Heno Martin was Professor Kluse's PhD student and was trying to develop his thesis and said, what shall I do? And Professor Clue said, go to Namibia. Um, if you're wanting to understand geology and rocks, this is the place. Uh, so he went 
and he had this remarkable career and uh, effectively fell in love with the country. Um, and most famously, um, on the verge of the Second World War, he was called up uh, to the armed forces and he was able to avoid his service by taking shelter in the desert, as his book describes. Uh, he spent the entirety of the Second World War camped out with his companion <laughs> in the Namib Desert, where he continued to study the geology. And he was actually one of the first surveyors to look at the Rossing uranium deposits. And I think in both uh, Heno Martin and in Hans Kloos, we see a kind of real humanist streak. Despite the, the structures and the world that they inhabited, uh, they saw geology as a science for good. They saw it in pure scholarly terms, uh, outside of capitalist structures, outside of colonialism. Perhaps that was a fault in itself. Um, but I see in Heno Martin's uh, records in the National Archives in Namibia that he does acknowledge, for example, the role of black labor in the development of the Rossing mine, which is not something you'll find in any of the, the histories. So I thought that was a nice segue uh, into my talk, um, which is entitled, uh, as Anne has mentioned, Radiant Empire, Nuclear Britain and the Making of Namibia. And I suppose what I'm trying to do here is take this notion of, of imperial radiance, um, of the civilizing properties that supposedly empire, European empire was supposed to bring the rest of the world and to understand how that was then instrumentalized through certain types of technology, and in this case, uh, through nuclear technologies. And of course, for Britain, the idea of converting uh, its uh, waning imperial power after the Second World War into a new techno-political project, a modern utopian project, which was nuclear energy and weapons, this was a very powerful trope at the time. Of course, the raw material for nuclear projects comes from uranium, and much of the uranium came from the African continent. Um, to begin with, the Congo, the Shinkawoble mine, uh, which had a very high grade of natural uranium of up to 60%. Um, according to certain accounts, you could actually see the hazy glow in the pitch black of the Congolese uh, night. Such was the purity of this particular material. And they say that the Manhattan Project wouldn't have been possible without it because uh, the technology to enrich uranium uh, just didn't exist. So having a 60% grade of U308 yellow cake was absolutely pivotal uh, to that moment uh, of nuclear development in, in history. So by flicking on a light switch in late 20th century Britain, an energy consumer could unveil a history of systematic extraction and historic violence. In parts of the UK, the electricity for this light was generated by Man Magnox nuclear power plants. And these were fed with uranium oxide from Namibia, a country illegally occupied by apartheid South Africa until independence on the 21st of March, 1990. And this is an example of, of one of the uh, Magnox nuclear power plants. Uh, I suppose the, the genius of the engineering here was that uh, basic uranium, uh, natural uranium, U308, could be fed straight away into the reactor system, whereas a lot of reactors depend on other types of enriched uranium. This is the Trolls Finneth plant in, in North Wales, which was the only nuclear power plant in Britain to be built controversially by an inland body of water. The rest are all on the coast of, of rivers. Now decommissioned. So unlike other sources of supply, a Namibian uranium came into the UK without safeguards, uh, meaning it could be used for nuclear weapons as well as power plants. And that's an important fact in the, in the history of African uranium. Uh, European and American programs often uh, looked into investing in uh, uranium procurement from African states because of this reason, because the uranium didn't come with uh, protective clauses uh, governed by the um, international treaties. So it could be used as a malleable currency in a nuclear machine for weapons or for energy. 
Um, and the mine that produced uh, this uranium, the Rossing mine in the Namib Desert, was also controlled by Rio Tinto Zinc, RTZ, uh, a British mining house with um, headquarters in St. James's Square, London. And in order to establish the mine and set up a company to run it, which became known as Rossing Uranium Limited, this multinational drew on support from the three states most active in the development and exploitation of Namibia. That is South Africa, the UK, and Germany. And these states ensured not only that Namibia remained Africa's last colony during a European decolonization, but also that its economy, infrastructure, and water resources were tailored around the task of exporting uranium for their nuclear industries. So the extraction of Namibian uranium for Western nuclear energy and weapons programs was only possible as a result of historical, long-term efforts to master and remake the Namib Namibian environment by European imperial powers, a phenomenon known among environmental historians as environing. And this term, uh, to quote Emanuel Kreiker, uh, draws special attention to the processes of environmental change, highlighting the pluralistic and differentiated character of the agency, motivations, and mechanics involved, including, importantly, among non-human actors, such as animals, insects, and microbes. In Namibia, this environing was accelerated and driven by European resource demands and forms of colonialism from, from around the mid-19th century, even though these were vigorously opposed by and never fully overcame African resistance and a myriad of natural forces, from outbreaks of viral diseases to the scarcity of water supplies in the Namib and the Kalahari deserts. So radical and violent was this will to environ, to control the environment, however, that the entire apparatus of the Namibian state can be seen as bearing its imprint from its geography on the map of Africa to the fabric of its post-colonial economy and politics, it is arguable that Namibia was an artifice of imperial environing, the direct inheritor in all but name of the colonial state called Southwest Africa. And the flagship industry around which the state had been environed was the Rossing Mine, a resource desiring and wealth producing uranium monster in the Namib desert. The basic history um, of the political geography of Namibia um, can also be usefully relayed through this, this framework. Um, from the outset, the evolution of this geography, though at no stage predetermined, was shaped by encounters between Europeans and the arid environments that encircled the central plateau of modern Namibia. To the west, these interior uplands are separated from the Atlantic Ocean by the Namib Desert, a coastal belt ranging from 15 to 85 miles in width. To the east, they are straddled by the Kalahari, which provided a natural border by which to demarcate Namibia from Botswana, or at the time, British Bechuana land. In combination with the perils posed by the Benguela Current, which swept up the Namib coast from Antarctica, these geographical features helped to insulate the heartlands of Namibia from European incursions. On the coast, these were limited to intermittent moorings by sailors in a futile search for deep water ports and riches en route to the Cape of Good Hope, beginning in 1485 with Diogo Cao, who erected a stone pillar at what became known as Cape Cross. When European incursions did increase in the 19th century, they did so as a byproduct of the British presence to the south in Cape Colony and Portuguese to the north in Angola. By 1850, it has been estimated that at least 80 traders and numerous missionaries were active across Namibia. Now, as Europeans infiltrated southwestern Africa, they began to make formulations about its geography, inhabitants, and resources in line with imperial knowledge and value systems. In the discovery literature produced by these figures for readers back in Europe, they assembled a picture of southwestern Africa by performing a crude ethnogeography. They made problematic links between territorial space and African race across three proposed theaters, which you can see on this map. Namakwaland and the Nama in the south, Damaraland and the Damara and Herrera in the center, and Ovamboland and the Ovambo in the north. And I should say that this map was drawn up by British explorer Francis Galton. Uh, he became uh, the father of British eugenics, uh, the idea of racial improvement um, from the late 19th century. 
And a lot of his experience and his work in eugenics was informed by his trip to Namibia, where he undertook an anthropological study of uh, the different ethnic groups uh, he felt he uh, could make comments on, and then took those findings back, um, became an honorary member of the Royal Ge Geographical Society, cemented his career, and then became really the key figure in, I suppose, British racial sciences um, from the 19th century. He also became a key figure um, for, for, for German anthropologists, uh, such as Eugene Fischer, who then went on to play um, a key role in, in the, the Third Reich. Um, so alongside these sweeping generalizations of ethnogeography, where complex relations within and between major ethnic groups were often overlooked, this space-race dialectic was disregarded in European framings of the San, or Bushmen, who were deemed a landless group. While this European ethnogeography was theoretical, it possessed socio-political power due to the elevated role of European missionaries and traders in the economies of southwestern Africa. These economies had already been brought into the orbit of European capitalism as mixed Dutch-speaking communities, collectively known as Orlam, were forced to migrate northwards from Cape Colony into Namaqualand. So the ethnogeography of European exploration, this laid the foundations for a, a fixed coercive regime of space and race under German colonialism between 1884 and 1915 and South African occupation between 1915 and 1990. The legal, technical and violent means by which Germany and South Africa implemented this spatial regime was also the process by which the political geography of modern Namibia was environed. If this began in the 1880s with African concessions of land and mineral rights to the German merchant Adolf Luderitz, then it culminated in the 1890s and 1900s when German Schutztruppe took punitive measures to restrict the movements of Africans across Southwest Africa with a particular focus on Herero pastoralism, Nama raiding and illicit traffic from the uncolonized North. These spatial restrictions became most effective and were quite often initiated during the Herero and Nama genocide of 1904 to 1908. And the genocide, which led to the loss of over half of the Herero population and over a third of the Nama, was the decisive enabler of imperial environing. It facilitated the introduction of pass laws, open lands for prospecting, and secured a police zone in which settlers could call upon German protection. In the words of Marion Wallace, it forged an enduring structure of unequal, racially determined land ownership. Indeed, it is tempting to interpret the genocide as an abomination of environing itself, since the Herrero in particular were regarded as an aspect of the environment that had to be removed, as Elizabeth R. Bayer has put it. When South Africa took Southwest Africa from Germany in the First World War in 1915, it left the spatial regime the Germans pioneered largely intact. And that's hardly a surprise given that the Germans had followed the pre precedent of Dutch and British past laws in Cape Colony in the first instance. So this history of imperial environing, of constructing Namibia and later turning it into a uranium state has profound implications for a researcher's vocabulary. Even the cartographic eponym, South West Africa, resounds with the spatial logic of this environing the name Southwest Africa being superimposed on governable space from the outside rather than emanating from geographies within. The state of Southwest Africa was consequently an abstraction from the environments it sought to control and reorder, a disembodiment of nature that enabled colonists to realize their own spatial schemes against rival ones of resistance. When invoking Southwest Africa and the names of the ethnic groups that inhabited its territories, one risks perpetuating an imperial system of classification as a result. Uh, this system was born out of the hegemonic project to reduce and restructure human nature relations to make them governable. To speak of Nama, Damara, Her Herero, and Avamba, Avambo is in this way to, to read the ethnographic present back into the past, as Wallace has, has put it. It is to imbue these ethnicities with a historical coherence that they never possessed. While these categories still have purchase in Namibia today, it must be recognized that they derive from colonial heritage, to quote Bridget Lau. Such categorizations have been harshly imposed 
and do violence to the data, to the far more amorphous and fluid identities and land relations that have existed historically. In post-colonial Namibia, the ruling party, the Southwest African People's Organization, or SWAPO, has sought to adapt to, rather than overhaul, this history of imperial environing and state building. The rise of SWAPO, in fact, was inextricably connected to its negotiation of imperial space. By operating from the north of the country, the organization was able to not only link up to the global Cold War through Angolan communists, it was also able to position itself beyond the traditional sphere of imperial power. And just a content warning in particular for, for the viewers on the online recording, I'm going to uh, show here the body of the uh, Kwanyama King, King Manjume. So it was able to position itself beyond the traditional sphere of imperial power. Um, the independent movement and SWAPO. And this northern frontier, located beyond the German police zone of the colonial period, had remained independent until the South African defeat of the Kwanyama king, Manjume Ya Andam in 1917. In this regard, the victory of SWAPO in Namibian independence signaled the reclamation of the center of the country, itself still suffering from the demographic effects of the genocide by the Ovambo North. Namibian independence was to this end a spatial inversion of the Southwest African state, with the outlaw North ascending to the mantle of the geographical center. And this has fed into latent tensions between centrally based Herero and the Northern based ruling class of Swapo, uh, particularly as Namibians grapple with one another over the German reparations for the genocide. The post-colonial state then has had to survive within the entrenched identities and infrastructures it was bequeathed, a consensus-building project in which the legacies of the colonial past require careful and constant management. And I'm just going to pause to say a little bit about these images which I scanned in the National Archives of the Namibia. And I think, first of all, what's so re revealing about them is the fact that this was documented by camera at all. And the reason for that is, in my view, the north of Amboland, as uh, colonial ethnography would have it, was seen as lawless, and it was seen as the last place to be colonized within the Namibian state. So the death of a warrior, a reputed mythologized warrior such as Manjume, was a really important iconic moment in the colonial mindset, which is why his body and his corpse here is being treated almost as a trophy. Um, so I think M King Manjume personified for the colonial powers, his death personified the complete defeat of uh, the Namibian uh, state, the Namibian environment. It was the last black spot on the map, if you like, to be conquered. And it was documented as a result of this. But there's another story to this as well, uh, which is the story of the resistance because it was an iconic moment, it could also be subverted. It could also be co-opted. And in the struggle for liberation, it, it was. Um, uh, this is a, a leaflet uh, in which they've used the original photography to reproduce the image of the king. Um, it was created by a Namibian Avambo artist, uh, Vilo Shilongo, um, in the mid to late 1980s. And he uses the, uh, the person, the image, of Manjumi to talk about resistance. Uh, the pamphlet talks about taking up your sword and fighting the whites, the white men who want to dispossess you of your land. They want to take over your throne, the reign of your land that you have rightfully inherited. They are not happy that you act in the spirit of those who ruled the land before you. By seeing the Uranium state of Namibia as a product of imperial environing, I'm hoping that my book will make a series of interventions into Namibian history. And first, um, I hope to place the Rossing mine in the deeper historical and geographical context um, and upheavals of the colonial period. 
as noted by Saima Ashipala, these histories of uranium and colonization have too often elided one another, largely because colonial historians have tended to give precedence to mineral extraction at the high point of formal colonialism, chiefly to diamonds uh, under German rule after their discovery by the African railroad worker Zacharias Luela in 1908. While the South African Ministry of Mines did not grant mining rights to Rossing until September 1970, it must be remembered that the mine's feasibility rested on a range of historical as well as purpose-built infrastructures, uh, including labor agencies, power cables, railroads, surveys, and water pipelines. And indeed, even a, an entire mining town was created. The town of, of, of Arandis was built by, by Rio Tinto Zinc to, to house workers. So in other words, the land and earth of the mine had to be environed before it could be worked, particularly in view of the remote location and the extremely low grade of the uranium ore, around 0.03%. And you think about what I was saying about the Congo uranium, this represents quite a difference. Um, and indeed, at the time that Rossing was opening in the 1970s, decade of, of the oil crisis um, and supposed turn towards nuclear, a geologist saw Rossing as um, the example of a new vanguard where um, all bodies of very minimal uh, uranium content could be enriched uh, for the nuclear age. So I would say it, it's this environing, these infrastructures, is what links the Rossing mine to far larger histories and structures of cl colonial power, uh, which also includes the violent genocidal dispossession of African inhabitants from their land in the first place. Um, the significance of this imperial past to Rossing gives rise to a second intervention, which is to devote as much space uh, in the proposed book to the origins of the Rossing mine as the period of its operation. And I think this talk is really kind of setting the scene, but I'm happy to answer questions about um, the actual active period of operation of Rossing, where the uranium went, how it affected geopolitics in the questions. Um, so as Robin Davignon uh, has suggested in her history of artisanal gold mining in West Africa, it is during exploration that the expectations and grievances for future extracted projects take shape in the political imagination and modes of storytelling. And anybody who has an, who has an interest in geology and wants to understand um, African agency within geological programs, uh, I would really recommend this book. I, I, I learned a lot of it. Um, Usually when you're searching for answers and theories in your own research and writing and you express them uh, so poorly like I do and then you read a book like this and you're like, that is what I meant to say. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed reading this book. Uh, but Avignon's point um, was also recognized by Edward Said who suggested that the struggle for empire is launched at the moment that the idea of what a given place was, could be, might become, coincides with an actual place. When taking this a step further and bringing analysis to bear not only on the extractive project, but also on the infrastructures that underpin it, the scope of Davignon's political imagination is also expanded. The history of the Rossing mine becomes not only about uranium, but also about land alienation, the railroad and water, the scarce resource that Rossing required in abundance. By interpreting Rossing in relation to land, rail and water as much as uranium, it is possible to produce a far richer perspective on the mine's history. And this history evoked and interacted with the key symbols of Namibian liberation, enshrined perhaps in the well-known phrase inscribed on the genocide memorial monument of the Namibian capital Windhoek, their blood waters our freedom. Blood, water and freedom were essential themes in the origins and development of the Rossing mine. In Said's conjuncture between the idea of a given place and an actual place, between real control and power, one can also locate, as he put it, not only the logic for Westerners taking possession of land, but also for African resistance and reclamation. A third intervention of this study then is to work towards what may, might be called an indigenous outlook on the landscape of Rossing, which today comprises part of the Orongo, one of the 14 regions of Namibia, of which the coastal town of Swakopmund is the capital. This outlook has been almost entirely precluded by the colonial view of the mine's geography, a wasteland made good by the uranium industry. It's such a common trope. You will see this in any history book. You'll see it in Rio Tinto's documents about the mine. It's a wasteland. If we didn't do anything with it, it would be no good for us. So such was the land alienation suffered by African inhabitants, 
uh, it is all also almost impossible to, to describe this geography without drawing on imperial sources. Uh, to borrow from Percy Wagner, a British geologist um, who studied Southwest Africa in the 1910s, the mine's location became part of the transitional zone that separates the Namib from interior uplands and the western foot slopes of the Commerce Highlands, behind which nestles Windhoek. And the southern part of this zone is dissected by the wild romantic gorges of the Khan, Swakop, and Kwiseb, which were ephemeral rivers that fill from sporadic rainfall on the central plateau. The northern part between the Ugab and Khan rivers is less rugged, consisting of shrub step and the occasional inselberg or island mountain, the most famous being the bold granite eminence known as Spitzkopper. And I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Gobabeb Desert Research Center, which you can see in the distance of this image, which is on the Kwiseb River. Uh, and, and, and the aquifer uh, of that river produces this wonderful verdure of trees and foliage. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. You walk along the riverbed, the, the dry riverbed, uh, amongst this greenery um, and surrounding wildlife. And it's uh, such a contrast to the, the harsh desert that surrounds it. And it's amazing life like this can be supported. Um, but you know, this is another kind of subplot of the Rossing Mine, which uh, the, the Kwiseb River was actually part of a British treaty um, when the British took control of the only deep water port uh, on the Namib coastline, Welvis Bay. Um, they also agreed to protect some of the coastal people who lived and made their livelihood um, out of the Kwiseb. Um, and those land rights, they, they still exist today. You can, you can meet these, uh, these people, they're called Aunin or Topna, uh, people of the furthest point or the furthest margin. Um, and they still have these land rights that were enshrined all the way back in the 19th century. Um, so it's a very interesting um, geography. Rossing drew a lot of its initial water, I think at its height, 24,000 cubic meters a day from the Kwiseb aquifer. So very problematic um, in, a, in a desert environment. So um, the task of retrieving an indigenous view of uh, the transient space between the Namib and the interior also raises the question of who can actually be deemed indigenous. Um, and while staying in Swakopmund in November last year, I overheard an exchange in a Swakopmund gem store between a Kosa family inquiring about African history in Namibia and the store owner, uh, most likely of Dutch Afrikaans heritage. Um, in what seems a common refrain about Namibian land rights, the owner explained how we're all colonizers apart from the San. He proceeded to recount successive ways of colonization from Herero migrants in the 17th century to Orlam in the 19th century. And this explanation has tended to reinforce uh, misconceptions about belonging and uh, indigeneity. For a start, it assumes that pre-colonial Africans shared the same ideas about land, place and property as European colonists, which of course they did not. Just as archeological research has shown that relations between African societies in the Namib were characterized by interdependence. Uh, sociological research has also shown the ongoing significance of pre-colonial modes of shared tenure for current land management. So alongside the argument that indigenous groups did not cultivate the land, the African colonization narrative also invokes another justification for European conquest. And this is that most Africans were not the original owners of the land they inhabited. This reading reduces African indigeneity to the principle of primogeniture, a troubling proposition given that most Namibians need to be mobile in order to survive the desert environment. Um, and so exp as explained by Roger Moody, who's campaigning for indigenous rights and against RTZ mines was highly interconnected. It did not follow that indigeneity must be defined by primogeniture. Quote, certainly not of the lands now occupied by communities such as the Adivazis of India, Inuit of North America, and the descendants of the Caribs and Arawaks. If these people fall within the terms of special priorities, rights, and recognitions they are now demanding, Moody wrote in 1992, it is not primarily, primarily because they were once in a particular place at a particular time, practicing certain beliefs and livelihoods. It is because they are in their present place or demanding a present place from which they have been uprooted at this point in time. In contrast, however, to land-based communities in Asia, America, and Australasia, who tended to find indigenous a useful term, Moody found that Africa's first peoples had been set apart by the sheer scale of invasions, 
removals and encroachments on their land. This meant that very few African people can identify their homeland, producing the paradox that nomadism and a shifting economy are perhaps the lifestyles most identifiable as of African indigeneity. When the genocide, forced removals, and homeland policies are factored into this equation, the puzzle of Namibian land rights becomes unfathomable. This vexed question of land has served to extend the interests of corporate and European elites into the post-colonial era, with the Namibian state rejecting even straightforward historical land claims because of their contested nature. The historical geography of the landscape around Rossing was historically sparse and transitory, a space frequented by coastal Nama, inland Herero, and San seeking refuge among the Inselberger, where they left behind their ancient record of rock paintings. In the mid to late 19th century, this transitional zone, as Wagner called it, formed the southwestern frontier of Herero territories under the leadership of Manas Chiseta, who was based in the growing settlement of Omaruru to the northwest. Since the land in the zone was unfit for the livestock grazing to which Herrera were accustomed, the small dwellings it did possess were often inhabited by poor, cattleless Herrero, known as Ovat Jimba, as well as by an ethnic group that became pivotal for the local geopolitics of the Rossing mine, the Damara. And these people, whose homeland would later border the mine during the apartheid period, have often intrigued anthropologists. Since they were dark-skinned, like the Herrero, yet also spoke the Kwekwe language of the Nama, the landscape around Rossing was also passed through by Nama, known as Topna, who I mentioned in Afrikaans, or Aunin in Kwekwe, and these people of the point, or of the fur furthest margin, as their name translates, tended to travel through the landscape via the dry riverbeds of the Khan and Swaka. Now, it's, it's one matter to map the historic communities of the Orongo region, quite another to reassemble their relationship with the land. Despite archaeological evidence and documentary fragments, such a task is like asking a researcher to enter another world, to strip back the fundaments of geographic understanding and substitute them from artifacts, rituals, and stories. When visiting the town of Arundis, the, the purpose-built uh, mining town for Rossing, or a nearby crystal market run by artisanal small-scale miners, I felt as though I stood on the precipice of that other world. Um, yet since I could only communicate with miners in English, rather than their native languages of Ochi Herrero, Ochi Vambo, and Kwe Kwe, I was unable to enter into the essence of environmental understanding their lives entailed. For miners who had migrated from the Avamba north, perhaps this did not exist. For those whose connection to the land was more rooted, perhaps it had been lost in the mists of time. In contrast to West Africa, where small-scale African gold miners jostled with mining corporations, a combination of land alienation and the harshness of the land landscape did not seem to produce the same sense of place. In, in, in this part of the Namib desert. Pre-colonial narratives of natural environments before uranium mining also seem stronger in North American and oceanic traditions. These tended to forewarn of the destructive potential of these environments, such as the cautionary tale of a serpent's radiant eggs near Elliott Lake, Canada, or the loss of a land's productivity, such as memories of peach tree farming among Digne in the Navajo Nation of the American Southwest. In tapping into the spatial imagination of those who had historical ties to the Orongo region, it has been necessary to interweave threads of evidence with modes of storytelling. Leanne Leddy, a Serpent River First Nations scholar who explores settler colonialism and uranium mining around Elliott Lake, has spoken of storytelling as vital for the ret retention of indigenous history and culture. Uh, the political nature of stories, she suggested, are an essential aspect of decolonization. As a non-participant and speaker, it is neither feasible, feasible nor right for me to tell such stories. Yet I can use anthropological studies and indigenous storytelling as interpretive cues for the evidence. I can also speculate on the role of animism and ritual and pre-colonial perspectives on land and earth. By doing so, it is possible to put Africans back into the origin story of Namibian uranium, a story from which their alienation has been as complete as it was from their land. In opening up this origin story, one also opens up a vision of the future that lay enthralled to white settlers and was materialized through the making of Namibia as a uranium state. 
where this vision cast uranium as a stepping stone towards nuclear modernity and desert rationalization, the future portended by this cosmic rock was far more ominous for traditional custodians of the land. In both cases, these visions revolved around the same defining and gendered symbols, fertility and the implications of uranium mining for health and nature locally as well as worldwide. How am I doing for time? Got another 10 minutes, perhaps? 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I think I can finish within that time. Thanks for your patience. Yes, I can do. Um, yet the political geography of Namibia has as much to do with earth as well as land. So a fourth intervention is to reveal how the European discovery of Southwest African geology gave rise to political and legal systems of extraction, themselves encompassing strategic configurations of surface and subsurface land rights. Uh, and in, in this regard, I've, I follow uh, Davignon, who strove for a regional approach by articulating her research around the Beremian Greenstone Belt, itself formed 2.1 to 2.2 billion years ago and host to West African gold, iron, and diamond deposits. Um, my study centers instead on the Damara origin, the product of a continental collision uh, about 5.5 billion years ago when the Earth's crust was driven upwards and exposed. In Namibia, this intertectonic structure comprises three belts that meet near Swakopmund, where the central belt extends inland towards the Lefilian arc of Central Africa, with which it is thought to possess similarities. Whereas the north and southward belts of the Domara origin are characterized by coastal mountain ranges along the Namib, the central Domara belt gains expression through what one geologist described as a gentle ramp from Swakopmund into the central interior. As if enticing the prospector inland, this natural corridor extends through the uranium-bearing lands of the Orongo region, which themselves generated a substantial proportion of Namibia's revenue by independence. Further inland to the northeast, the Damara belt leads to Sumeb, the, as you well know, ancient copper works once labeled the world's uh, greatest mineral locality, uh, to, to borrow from Salvi Hearth, who gave a previous lecture here. The European struggle to locate mineral riches in southwestern Africa, though far from an exact science, became a major factor in the making of Namibia. Despite its significance for colonial constructions of ethnic identity and labor practice, practices, however, the role of geology in this respect has been underappreciated. A shortcoming, given that homeland policies and past laws had their origins in South African attempts to, quote, maintain a steady supply of Kaffirs uh, for the mines. Only towards the end of the Cold War did historians begin to theorize links between geology, the genocide, and labor, the breakaway coming from East Germans who placed geology within prevailing relations of production. The negotiation of these links arguably served as a politics for black miners and white managers of Rossing uranium 60 years after the genocide. These were manifest in an attempt by the Herero chief, Clemens Capuo, to prosecute Rio Tinto Zinc in London for building the mine on his people's land. They were also manifest in the career trajectories of Herero figures within the Rossing mine and then the Namibian state, suggesting that appointments within the mine preempted a post-colonial political class. The link between uranium and the genocide in the Namibian state was personified, above all, by uh, Dr. Zadikia Engavaru, uh, also Herero, who served not only as chairman of Rossing Uranium between 1985 and 1990, but also from 2015 as special envoy on bilateral negotiations between Namibia and Germany on genocide, apology, and reparations. By focusing on Earth, however, it is possible to go beyond African adaptation or subjugation to European geological systems. In what has proven to be a wellspring for, wellspring for indigenous environmentalism in non-African contexts, it is also possible to reinterpret or revive lost relations with the Earth. This revival can be theorized in relation to either the European excavation of African soils or the rediscovery of indigenous indigenous non-European mining practices. 
The former approaches European mining as a mode of historical disinterment, the digging up and destruction of material pre-colonial paths in the pursuit of mineral wealth. Perhaps no one knows more about these paths in Namibia than John Kinahan, who has carried out archaeological surveys across all of the uh, country's uranium sites. And while these surveys are often conducted to satisfy post-independence environmental regulations, the mining sector's evaluation of which artifacts register as heritage worth saving remains a highly uh, racialized process. And so what I, I, I'm getting at there, I don't think I've expressed it particularly well upon reflection, is that, of course, when you're mining ore bodies, um, when you're extracting things, you come across archaeological history. <laughs> and then it's what you do with that history. Uh, so mining... Um, is a form of historical disinterment. Um, and you know, across all of the seven, eight, nine uranium sites in Namibia today, there have been um, archaeological surveys uh, conducted which tell us something about what, what usage was made of that land before. And it's that, that particular archaeological record which I think we need to make more of. Um, African mining and smelting in, in southwestern Africa also far predated, of course, European colonization and the introduction of industrial mining technologies. As a result, the history of African mining and the rituals that surrounded it can broaden and inspire the historical imagination, since they offer insights into alternative, disempowered relations with the land. Uh, and this ritual geology, as de Avignon calls it, represents in Namibia a hidden tradition of how Africans interacted with mineralized lands, where all bodies were assigned a contrasting set of agencies and values to those subject to uh, resource colonialism. Uh, I've got five minutes left here. Altogether, this history facilitates a fifth and final intervention. It enhances interpretations of the transition between the colonial and post-colonial state through the inheritance of uranium infrastructures. The establishment of those infrastructures and the rise of the uranium industry were only possible through a history of colonial violence. But by the time of Namibia's independence in 1990, these had become ingrained in the fabric of the Namibian state. The structuring of Namibia around uranium and other minerals had become so implanted and routinized that it formed a key framework by which Namibians could know themselves and navigate their environment. This framework, manifest in borders, exports, labor, roads and water, was a major basis for post-colonial consensus, one in which the future of the uranium industry and RTZ was not only guaranteed, but also promoted at home and abroad by the Republic's first president, Sam Onyoma. This industry continued to be the leading funder and generator of environmental knowledge in and about Namibia, its experts and technicians making decisive breakthroughs in the science of desert ecosystems in particular. No environmental institution or scientist can realistically remain independent from the tentacles of the uranium industry in the central coastal region of Namibia today. Even before independence, the economic and environmental future of Namibia had already been foreclosed. The idea of another Namibia, a Namibia, a Namibia beyond or independent from uranium mining, lay in the reservoirs of the nation's problematic, often violent past. The fantasy of what Namibian uranium could do for the Namibian state and nuclear Britain proved particularly captivating in the environmental and imperial context into which Rossing was born. From one perspective, the challenges of the desert offered a strong pretext for nuclear desire, one that reflected older ideologies about the redemption of the desert and the savior of Western technology. From another perspective, the end of the British Empire combined with the remaking of Britain's global influence, also meant that British politicians, businessmen, and scientists assigned a special significance to nuclear technologies, particularly at a time of strife in the UK's fossil fuel industries. If only those pioneers of colonial Namibia could invent a technology or harness a material that enabled them to overcome the constraints of the land. If only British planners could acquire new techniques of global power in place of empire, such predicaments were best answered by nuclear illusions. Rather than getting caught in the false optimism of these radiant visions, this history seeks to deconstruct and track them, stretching from the nuclear zenith to the subterranean source. In short, I'm seeking to put nuclear history back into the earth, to take nuclear transcendence and situate it in long-standing disputes over land and earth, 
ones that invoke the futures of African land users as much as those of white settlers and European technocrats. Thank you.